Today in video notes, you guys are going to learn how to identify different types of forces and understand when they're relevant in different situations. So let's look at what we already talked about in class. We talked about a situation where a bowling ball is resting on a table and we asked the question, does it feel any pushes or pulls? Does it feel any forces? If so, what are they? Uh, what direction does it feel those pushes or pulls? And what's actually causing those forces? So we identified two forces. The first was the force of gravity on the ball by the earth, and the second one was something we called the normal force. So because the bowling ball has mass, the earth is pulling down on the bowling ball, and we call that force gravity. We labeled it FGBE, which stands for the force of gravity on the bowling ball by the earth. Remember, F stands for force. The next letter is the type of force. The next letter is what's feeling the force, and the last letter is what's dealing the force, or what's causing the force in the first place. Because the bowling ball is being pulled down by the earth and it's resting on the table, it's causing the table to flex a little bit. Even though we can't physically see it, the molecules are being kind of compressed into one another. They don't want The table doesn't want to be flexed, the molecules don't want to be compressed, and so they're pushing back up with a force we call the normal force. We labeled that uh, Fn, so it's the force normal, on the bowling ball by the table. You can see it how we have that written down here as we did our notes. So today we're going to look at other types of forces that can be felt by objects, whether it's us or a bowling ball, other than just the normal force and the force of gravity. To introduce a new force, let's imagine the forces that I feel when just hanging motionless on a rope. We know gravity is pulling down on me, but what's counteracting that force keeping me from accelerating downward? Unless there's some unforeseen force, the only things that could be pushing or pulling on me would be things that I'm touching, so the rope must be involved. But why would the rope be pulling on me, or pulling up on me, when I'm hanging on it? Look closely as I put my weight on the rope and then take it off to see if you can figure out why. Let's look a little bit closer at the relaxed rope as I put my weight on it and take it off again. Notice, as I put my weight on the rope, the rope starts to stretch. As soon as I take my weight off, it goes back to its relaxed, unstretched position. Watch it again. Stretched, and then again, unstretched. This is a lot like the normal force. When pushing on the table, the table doesn't like to be bent, and so when it is bent or flexed, it's going to push back. Similarly, the rope, when it's stretched beyond its normal length, doesn't want to be stretched, and so it's going to pull back against that when it is in its stretched state. When it's stretched out like that, we'd say the rope has tension in it, and so we call this force, this pulling force, the force of tension. So in your notes, let's define the force of tension. We define it as the pulling force in a rope, string, or rubber band when it is stretched. So let's make a force diagram for a climber that's suspended at rest on a rope that's just hanging there and not moving. We know because the climber has mass, gravity's pulling down with a force. We call that, let's label it FGPE, which stands for the force of gravity, force of gravity on the person by the earth. And because the person is at rest and not moving, we know there must be some other push or pull upward counteracting the force of gravity. Because the rope is stretching uh, under the pull of gravity and the rope naturally doesn't stretch, when it stretches, it's going to pull back against that stretch with a uh, force we call the force of tension. So we're going to label that FTPR, which stands for the force of tension on the person by the rope. And just to make sure anybody reading this force diagram can interpret what these letters are, we need to make sure we write down what the subscript definitions are. So P is equal to person, R is equal to rope, and E is equal to earth. At this point, I'll let the Mythbusters introduce our next force. Welcome back. Here's where we stand so far. Jamie and I got word that interleaving the pages of two phone books yielded something incredibly strong. Does this remind you of when you used to count money for the mob? I was a hitman. I wasn't a money counter. <laughs> So we did it, and we tugged on them. We couldn't separate them. <laughs> we got ten friends together. They couldn't separate them. Runs! Runs! We got two cars, and still, those phone books wouldn't be separated. 
but we're not going to leave it there. We went out and found a couple of tanks. Behind me is 30 tons of military steel, 650 horsepower. Are they going to separate the phone books at this point? I have no idea. But I do know that something is going to happen. I was trying to make a phone call. That's all I wanted to do. Okay, go ahead and pull slack. With the lightest of touches on the throttle, the tanks ease delicately apart. The careful positioning not reflected by the force gauge needle. That's 1,000 pounds of force so far. With the slack taken up, Jamie signals the start. 30 tons of mighty military machines slowly begin to move in opposite directions. And the force gauge climbs quickly. But the courageous phone books, you couldn't call them yellow, hang on for all their work. Oh, it separated, it worked. The force that makes it difficult to separate the phone books is the same force that slows down a skidding car when the tires lock up. Or the force which allows a 4x4 truck to crawl up over rocks. This force is called the force of friction. Skydivers even feel a frictional force from the air pushing up against them as they're falling through it. So we're going to now define the force of friction as the force opposing motion or potential motion when two surfaces are in contact with one another, or in the situation of the skydiver, when the skydiver is falling through the air and the air particles are colliding with his, his or her body, uh, we'll say that the skydiver is feeling a force of friction. Whenever we draw the force of friction in a force diagram, we're going to label it as F sub F, standing for force of friction. So let's make a force diagram for a simple situation where a truck is moving to the right and skidding to a stop. If the truck is moving to the right and it's slowing down, we know that it must feel a force pushing back against it or pulling back against it in the opposite direction that it's moving. So if it's moving to the right and slowing down, we know that there has to be a force back to the left. That's the force of friction. So we're going to label that uh, the force of friction on the truck by the road, since the friction between the truck and the road is what's causing it to feel that resistive force. Because the truck has mass, we know that it feels a force of gravity, so we're going to label, label that the force of gravity on the truck by the earth. And since the truck is resting on the road, and the road is being flexed a little bit under the weight of the truck, we know the road has to be pushing up with a normal force. So we're going to label that the force normal, on the truck by the road. And our subscript definitions, T stands for truck, R stands for road, and E stands for earth. We've just got one more force to introduce. What does that do? Make you walk the magic. Kate's head is magic. It really does seem like magic. There's something holding that balloon to the wall, or in this case, pulling it up to the ceiling. This force we call the electrostatic force. The electrostatic force is a force that's caused by the forces between positive and negative charges. Here we see a charged straw which has been charged by rubbing it on somebody's head, being attracted to an uncharged or neutral hand. Notice that there's no contact that needs to be made for the force to be felt. Here we've got a neutral piece of metal, a knife, now being attracted to a, a charged piece of plastic. Notice, again, you don't actually have to have the two objects touching for that force to actually be felt. Let's go back to the example of the balloon motionless on the ceiling, where the electrostatic force is pulling it up into the ceiling. Let's start with the force of gravity. Since we know the balloon has mass, even though it has a small mass, gravity is still pulling down on it. So we're going to label that FGBE, which stands for the force of gravity on the balloon by the Earth, since the Earth is what's pulling on the balloon. The force which is pulling up, keeping that balloon into the ceiling, we call that the electrostatic force. So we're going to define the electrostatic force as the force, which, is, which can be a push or a pull between positive and negative charges. So we're going to label that FEBC, which stands for the force electric, or the electric force, on the balloon by the ceiling. And since the balloon is actually touching the ceiling and it, it's being pulled into the ceiling, 
the ceiling is actually flexing just a little bit, even at the small microscopic molecular level. And the ceiling doesn't want to be flexed like that, and so it's going to push back with a small little normal force. So we have to include a little force normal on the balloon by the ceiling. And lastly, just make sure you define your subscripts. So in our force diagram, B represents balloon, C represents ceiling, and E represents the Earth.